That's very clear and very helpful. Thank you. John Whittinger. Um, Follow up the, some of the questions Alistair has been raising. Uh, it, it seems to be the case that for a lot of sectors in this country, one of their concerns is at the moment they are able to uh, trade uh, across Europe because the British regulatory regime in their particular sector complies with European standards and that would be in, we've heard from Creative Industries with Ofcom, with Food Standards Agency, with Financial Tax yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know, the, particularly the general data protection regulations. None of those things are going to change the day we leave the European Union. Therefore, surely it should be very simple to say, look, we already comply with your requirements. You recognise Ofcom, for instance, as being a competent regulator. Um, will you accept, therefore, that you should continue to do so? And that mutual recognition, which addresses a lot of the concerns, should be relatively simple to obtain. Well, that is, I, I think, Roderick Abbott yesterday was referring to the continuity th thesis, as he put it, and I understand that, and of course, in the last several months have been arguing it. Um, but let me say what I think the problem with it, it is, or could be, um, because I think you alluded to it, which is on day one. Um, so the thesis I know is that we start off in full conformity. You know us, uh, oh, EU 27, we've been a member for the last 45 years. You know we're in conformity. You know we, we, we converge with you. What's the problem? Why is day plus one after exit any different from day minus one before exit? Um, and by dint of what we've imported in the Great Repeal Bill, we've imported large chunks of the acquis. What's the problem? You know, let's, can't we just act as sane, sensible human beings? I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for, the, uh, for that view, and therefore we could just have untrammeled trade on exactly the same terms on day one as we had on day minus one. Now, the problem is the EU doesn't really work like that. If I can, no, you may say that's part of the problem with the EU and a good reason to get out of it. But um, the EU will yes, say... Um, uh, the EU will say, but you're now a third country. Uh, you're not a member, and you're not in the single market, and you're not respecting supranational jurisdiction or supranational law, and you're not adhering to it, and you're not paying your dues, so you're no longer a member. We're going to treat you as a third country. Um, and they'll say, well, that's your choice. You deliberately chose to do it, and you've taken yourself out of supranational jurisdiction, taken yourself out of the single market, recognised you're not in the single market, so you can't complain about it. And they will say, and this I know is a, a, a tortuous and controversial uh, debate, but it is the reality of what I faced on a daily basis in Brussels. They will say, well, automatically, by becoming a third country as opposed to a member, it's not that we deliberately bugger you up by erecting new barriers against you. I mean, that, that, that may come. But uh, we don't do that, um, you know, to generally irritate you and... Uh, those barriers exist for any third country, and you've now become a third country. So we haven't erected new barriers. They are just the barriers that exist for anybody who has third country status vis-a-vis -vis our jurisdiction. So how, how do they deal then with third countries? And this is the core of the problem. Um, the core of the problem is not day one. What colleagues said to me and my good colleagues and good friends and the people I debated with this endlessly over many months, including before the referendum, is, well, the problem isn't day one, the problem is day two or day 200 or day 2000. And what have you just recaptured your sovereignty and autonomy for if you're now saying, but we'll line up via um, the Great Repeal Bill, which, you know, they might say is more like a great cut and paste bill, uh, to repeat exactly what you had when you're in the European Union. If you are a third country in EU jargon and doctrine, first of all, you have to be on a list of countries permitted to export into the EU market. Secondly, individual firms then have to be approved. And thirdly, individual consignments of goods have to be cleared before the good or services, goods and services are allowed on the EU market. So that applies to all non-member states. So that's my point in, in response to what I perceive to be the kind of, well, why isn't WTO only fine? We've moved to a world outside, but they all know that we are the same beast the day after as we were the day before. Um, 
they would say, no, the world doesn't work like that, and our legal order doesn't work like that. And if there is no agreement with us, you move into a legal void. It's not that you are a once member state. You've become a third country, and unless until you've got a preferential agreement which enables you to trade on preferential terms, you can't trade on preferential terms. Um, and that's why no other major player, this is where I part company with some of what I'm reading on WTO only, no other major player trades with the EU on pure WTO only terms. So it's not true that the Americans do, or they get Australians, or the Canadians, or the Israelis, or the Swiss. Um, they strike preferential trade deals where they can, but they also strike more minor equivalence agreements, financial services equivalence agreements, veterinary equivalence agreements, mutual conformity of assessment agreements. The EU has mutual conformity of assessment agreements with the US, with Canada, with Israel, with Switzerland, with Australia, with New Zealand, and more, I think. I was part of negotiating some with the US in 1998. It's not true to say that EU-US trade is governed solely by the WTO. Indeed, and actually the, the, you bring me on to the point I wanted to pursue, which is that you say that on day plus one we become a, a third country. The EU has established trading agreements with a number of third countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, it allows barrier-free access without being covered by the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice yeah. and um, also without requiring freedom of movement of people. Yeah. Um, Canada at one end and Ukraine at the other end are examples yeah. of two countries that have exactly that. Yeah. So completely agree. when you said earlier the Germans have said, sorry, that is not a possibility to have that kind of barrier-free access without those things, they've already conceded it to other countries. Uh, well, I agree with the first bit, but uh, the, the, the second is a slightly different point. I mean, uh, what I, I, mean, I shouldn't be revealing, I'm sure, to the Committee what I've essentially been arguing for the last several months, but um, uh, an FTA, and a deep and comprehensive FTA, or whatever you want to call it, is something that um, I think is a perfectly viable destination for us, ultimately. It obviously depends how long you take, because an FTA is not at all like single market membership. It doesn't involve the jurisdiction of the court, and it does involve complete control of your own borders. So candidly, I have been saying within, if control of your own borders and no jurisdiction by the ECJ are your desiderata, the answer to that is leave the customs union, leave the single market, and strike an FTA, and as comprehensive an FTA with the EU as you can get, but I think it would have to cover services. What's the problem with the WTO, of which I'm a huge fan, I'm a multilateral trade uh, person really, and a, a, an, uh, an extreme trade liberal, as anybody in Whitehall would tell you, but I'm a multilateralist. The problem with the WTO is it hasn't got very far on services. It's Gats, as Roderick Abbott, who pretty much wrote the book on this, told you yesterday, hasn't delivered an enormous amount other than generic commitments. So to get services liberalisation across borders has been very difficult to do multilaterally. You don't get very far on market access and services. And therefore, I think my proposition, whether it's on financial services, professional services, or other services, is what the UK ideally may want with the EU, and I hope vice versa, is the biggest free trade agreement ever struck, which covers not only goods and tariffs, but also covers services, and services in a way that goes far deeper than has happened for EU Canada or for EU South Korea. It's got to be an unprecedentedly good and bespoke deal. I, I'm in favour of it. But if, if I may, then, maybe I could give you some examples of then, well, what's the difference between being in a single market and a free trade area? Because there is some. It's not true to say that you get everything you want from an FTA, and it's just the same as a single market. So. This is the crucial difference between access to the market and membership of it. So, for example, on planes, aeroplanes, access to the single market means planes can land in EU uh, airports and return from EU airports. Membership of the single market means you get slot and gate and lounge allocation on the same terms as local airlines i.e. not 3 a.m. slots in, you know, um, at a mile away from the terminal, and the airlines can fly within the EU, not just to and from the EU. Um, access means that your banks can only lend via a local subsidiary. Um, membership means there's no need for your banks to be separately supervised, regulated, managed and capitalised uh, uh, subsidiary in other countries, you, you know, that one can operate through branches, and that home state rules and supervision suffice. Access means that stock can be sold.
into France or Germany or whatever, membership of the single market means that all taxes and duties for comparable products to Scotch must be the same as for Scotch. And if they're not, you can be taken to the ECJ or we can take them to the ECJ and say, why are they not? We won't be able to take them to the ECJ when we've, when we've only got access. It's not the same as membership. No. So I'm not, I, but but I, agree, I am agreeing with you violently, I think, that the right answer is an FTA.